All right, good afternoon. Thank you everyone for attending today's webinar, The Challenges of Robotic Design. My name is Paul Heaney and I'm the Editorial Director of Design World. And uh, a few housekeeping tips before we get started. If you wish to tweet about this webinar anytime during or after, you can use the hashtag DWWebinar, all one word. Uh, we will have a Q&A session after the presentation. So you can go ahead and, your, and submit your questions as you think of them, and then we'll ask as many of, the, of them as we can after all of the presenters are finished. Uh, the questions can be asked using the GoToWeb dialog box on your screen. And then this webinar will be available afterwards on our website, designworldonline.com, as well as you will get an email link to the exact uh, place to, to view this afterwards. Today's webinar is brought to you by Harmonic Drive, National Instruments, Maxon Motors, IGIS, and Design World Magazine. So thank you to all of our sponsors. Uh, once again, my name is Paul Heaney. I'm the Editorial Director of Design World. A little background on me. I have a mechanical engineering degree from Georgia Tech, and I've been covering the engineering and manufacturing space for more than 15 years, and I'm pleased to be your moderator today. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our three presenters for being here today, as well as to introduce them. Uh, in order, Nick Hunt has a degree in electronic engineering technology from the University of Cincinnati. He's been working in the robotics field since 81, and his current position at ABB is Manager Automotive and Emerging Technology of the Robotic Products Group. Our second speaker today, Eric Neves, is currently Technology Director for Yaskawa Motoman Robotics. He's responsible for the Corporate Strategic Technology Roadmap and he has a special focus on emerging applications. During Eric's 20 plus year tenure there, he's had a variety of leadership positions in the US and abroad. And our final speaker today, uh, Ryan Grippy, is CTO and co-founder of ClearPath Robotics. Ryan has been focused on unmanned systems since he began his engineering studies, and he believes that through the explosion of interest in these unmanned systems, the widespread commercial use of autonomous systems is not far away, and that robotics can be made as easy to use and reliable as any other tool. So with that, uh, on to our first presenter. Without further ado, I'm going to hand the mic over to Nick. Okay, well thank you very much, Paul. Safety uh, and ease of use in robotics. Uh, this uh, computer is a little slow in reacting over the uh, internet here. I'm uh, on a wide connection, so I apologize for that. So what is a safe uh, robot system? Uh, what do we view as uh, uh, when a robot system is uh, truly safe? Well, it's when you've uh, you've assessed uh, the hazards and you've qualified them, and uh, the measures have been implemented by OEMs um, of the, the, the supply components to the, the overall system and the system design engineers. Uh, the procedures uh, are well documented and easily made available uh, for everyone that has to use the uh, and operate the system. And then you've trained the workers in the use of these uh, safety features that you've designed into the, into the system. So now after all that's finished, uh, the robot system is considered uh, safe. And uh, you should be uh, ready to uh, use it. And Isaac, uh, Isaac uh, Asimov would be very proud of, uh, of your design. If it uh, comes up, the, re the uh, response time over the internet uh, now is uh, very, very slow. So there we have it. Moving forward. A rising uh, collaboration, uh, that comes up a lot, and it, it, it is a game changer. Um, and this is what I was afraid would happen. It, uh, it's picking a click, uh, buffering them up. So I apologize for that. I have to wait. The system catches up here a little bit. Okay. 
Okay, hopefully it stays there and doesn't move anymore. Acceleration, a game changer. It, it is a rising trend in the design of automation these days. Um, it, the modernization of uh, the robots, the paradigm, uh, is really something that, that is occurring all around us right now. So, and that entails the, the, the stop circuitry philosophy and the way we design uh, stop circuitry in robots. And that all changed. Yeah, there was a, an old technology that many of you may remember. It was called the Holt circuit. It was way back from when robots were actually uh, hydraulic and uh, when they lost power uh, or when the, uh, when the hydraulic pump shut down, the, the arm could actually drift or fall. Uh, dry contact uh, e-stops uh, are allowed now uh, over safety bus, so now uh, you don't have to necessarily have hard wires uh, going to the safety chain. It can be done over a bus. That was a very large step. Um, so there's a new philosophy of, uh, of safe motion monitoring as well. Mechanical stops are obviously they're replaced by, uh, by software. We, and you could call these redundant safety systems. Humans are handling uh, the part, the handing the part to a live robot. Um, this is something that was unheard of you know, you know, 15 years ago, and it's, it's the norm now. Um, and uh, the uh, factory floor design is uh, going to become uh, more open and uh, uh, less uh, hard, uh, hard um, safety barriers. So inherently safe robots uh, really intensify uh, collaboration uh, with humans because um, we have to assume that there will be uh, some uh, robot to human contact. It, it, it's, it's bound to occur. Just like when you're working at close quarters with, uh, with someone next to you on a line, you're going to uh, occasionally bump into them or you're going to bump into a robot that you're collaborating with. We have to assume that. So what, uh, what we have to do is make sure that there's a low enough momentum that uh, no uh, injury occurs to the human. But what are the elements of the safe robot system? Well, obviously, uh, these, these should look pretty familiar to most of you. Safety uh, interlock, uh, fixed guarding, uh, physical stops or certified or some certified alternative of a physical stop. And um, of course, uh, for us, the uh, ABB, that's uh, products like uh, EPS and, and safe move. Uh, E-stops and dual-channel stops are still the norm. Uh, palm buttons, gate boxes, safety mats, those are all uh, usually found in a, in a safe system, especially uh, in a system where robots and, and humans, where they have to do some interaction like handing a part to the robot. Robot servo lockout box, that's pretty old-fashioned, but you'll still see them out there. Scanners, light fences, um, and volumetric sensing. So these are, this is optical sensing uh, devices that allow us to, um, along with the floor scanners, to uh, look at the volume and see uh, where items are in, in the volume and how fast they're approaching the robot, how far away they are from the robot, and of course, uh, the, the safety PLC. These are all elements of the safe robot system. Because one thing you, you really don't want to do is is uh, have an operator uh, all of a sudden interact with that robot system. Um, because they're really trained to, to be, they're trained to, you know, push the uh, push the button on uh, on the interface, whatever that interface might look like, and uh, the system is meant to be in auto uh, the entire time, and without any a lot of without a lot of manual interaction, or certainly without having to go into the uh, the cell. Having trouble with the uh, advance of the slides again. Hopefully it stays there. Ease of use, arguably uh, second only to safety. Uh, ease of use can be can be viewed or should be viewed as an enabler to safer operation. Uh, consistent and intuitive operation is very important. Um, it also effectively increases the worker skill level. I hear this a lot these days where uh, the plant manager would, would like to um, uh, uh, 
more skills than to, and you can do, uh, if you have IntelliDyne of uh, your uh, diagnostic system and a, a fault enunciation. So the emphasis is on automatic operation and the use of pokey hooks whenever you can. And as, as soon and as, as far upstream in the system as you can or in the process. The common elements of that are uh, GUI-based uh, HMI and configuration wizards. Uh, the, the, uh, the picture on the right, I show um, a, a safe move, a system, uh, the wizard that uh, where we're contouring uh, this, the, the, um, the work envelope around the robot, uh, showing the uh, protected area around the cell. Offline cell simulation, direct upload robot. Of course, most things, many things are done offline these days, and where you can load the, the program directly into the, the robot. The interfaces are uh, very user friendly now, uh, and uh, there's a, a very high connectivity uh, to uh, PCs and laptops from, from uh, robot systems these days. Uh, dynamic exception handling and recovery, like I mentioned before, and what dynamic means is that uh, we determine the, the cause of the fault during runtime, and that the application design uh, anticipated all the faults that uh, would reasonably occur and has already designed in the recovery process for the operator and presents that in a, in a well enunciated message with some recovery option. And of course, context sensitive help is also very important uh, uh, to uh, ease of use. So uh, what I call it is a philosophy of minimum exposure. Um, you, you're, you, you have to be vigilant, uh, vigilant in, uh, in your hazards analysis process and eliminate uh, and control them uh, as best you can. Design in ease of use as an enabler to uh, safe operation and don't do it after the fact. It should be way up front in the design and the concept of, of, your, of your manufacturing cell. Employ pokey oaks uh, whenever and wherever possible. Um, that way, you don't wait till uh, you move from pounds to the uh, cycle start position, and then find that uh, well, there was a part missing, or it was out of specs, or something like that. Do it way up front. Seek to eliminate ambiguous fault enunciation. If you're not sure, um, if an operator isn't sure what what the fault means. Um, they're going to select something, and they may select uh, the wrong thing. Again, the dynamic exception handling uh, it really provides a, an intelligent method of fault recovery. And of course, uh, what do you do when there's just nothing that can happen? Uh, the part just can't be processed. Well, allow uh, for rejects and cell layout and application design. And that uh, that ends my uh, my presentation. Thanks, Nick. That was great information. Uh, appreciate it. And next up, we have Eric. Just a moment. Okay. So let me first turn that off. Looking at the uh, robotics development trends, um, you know, where we're at today in uh, 2013. When we think about robots, we're always thinking in terms of a fairly important volume of product, right? A large lot size, um, you know, uh, automotive industry is where most robots are sold. Uh, and that's largely due because they have the volume and they also have very repeatable tasks. You program it once and run it for, you know, a couple of years before you really have to touch it again. Um, and what that allows for then is for this programming to happen from a robot expert, someone with some uh, training or expertise in, in robot uh, functionality. Um, robots today, if they have a sensor, it's typically just a two-dimensional vision system. 
um, and the robot um, is largely locked away uh, from the people. So as Nick was pointing out, those are things that uh, we're uh, wanting to see change moving forward. And then lastly, uh, currently in 2013, robots are generally bolted to the floor and the work comes to them. But as we look forward, um, you know, out to, you know, 2020 or uh, beyond, we're looking at really trying to make from robots into production partners. And, and what does a production partner do? Well, it means that you'll be able to work on a smaller lot size, right? Labor is very flexible and fluid. We're able to move from one work to the next very readily. Uh, robots aren't like that. So we need to be able to move towards a higher mix, lower volume uh, paradigm. Ultimately, that means you have to consider the programming effort of a one-off task as really the rule and not the exception, which means then that the programming effort must be much uh, less cumbersome. And that's something that Nick touched on earlier is this ease of use is very significant. Um, so automatically generated programs are going to be uh, much more common as will be more straightforward means of programming uh, the robot motions. Uh, I like to say robots will be more successful when no one needs to remember which way is Y negative. Um, perception is going to increase. Uh, we're trying to uh, move towards more types of perception, uh, not just vision, but also tactile and force and uh, moving vision from two-dimensional to three-dimensional vision, and ultimately tying these different sensor modalities together in what we call sensor fusion. Uh, because even low resolution sensors used in combination are much more robust. Um, and then, you know, we know that a production partner will share space with its human partner. Uh, and, you know, robots will be freely deployable meaning they will move to the work much like labor does today. So when you distill these requirements for the future, you know, uh, we focus on perception, mobility, and ease of use. And um, I'm going to not spend much time on mobility because Ryan's going to do a, a thorough job in explaining that and its design constraints for us. But I'm going to move forward. You know, on the vision side, 2D vision is very mature technology, and it's widely applied. There are lots of robots in production today where you can design in um, a vision system that will look at X, Y, theta, and, you know, let you pick from a flat surface, et cetera. Where we're moving uh, in 3D vision, uh, that's not a mature technology. That's on still on an upward innovation curve. So there's lots of different players in that market. Um, there is no dominant uh, provider of 3D vision. Um, and ultimately what we're trying to solve is the, the mixed bin picking problem, right? Where you have a collection of dissimilar components in a box and the robot is able to not only discriminate them, but pick them using some sort of uh, uh, flexible gripper and singulate them for processing. But perception goes beyond that, right? Um, as we um, have found, the Kinect sensor has been a revolution really in, in uh, robotic perception. Uh, first, it is low cost. Now, the robot industry is a, uh, you know, seems like it's a big thing, right? There were 20,000 or some odd robots uh, sold last year. But in fact, that is a minute number compared to the number of consumer gadgets and glowing screens we buy on an annual basis. So the robot industry can't drive its own technology. We have to depend really on other industries to give us the advancements we need. And a lot of that comes out of consumer goods and consumer electronics. One of them is here is the Kinect sensor, right? So it generates for us a very robust uh, point clouds that we can use for uh, 3D mapping of a workspace, and it does so at a low cost. Um, on the right, we're using that same sensor now as a teaching tool, where we're using skeleton tracking uh, as an input device um, for robot teaching. And you bring those together, 
and what we're trying to achieve is ease of use. Now, uh, on your screen, you're seeing a robot that's depalletizing a uh, pallet it's never seen before. Uh, this is uh, using sensors built into the end effector. So you have the vacuum gripper, but it's also using 3D vision and a set of rules to determine what the orientation and such of the next box is. So from a vision perspective, this is important, but it's even more significant in that no one had to pick up the programming pendant and teach these uh, uh, trajectories or these patterns. They are automatically generated by the rules within the robot control. So this is where you are using perception and heuristics to affect ease of use. But we indicated that there's more to perception than just vision, right? So there's a lot of them out there. There's, uh, of course, your force torque sensors. Um, on the lower left is a tactile sensor. Uh, this is, uh, can understand surfaces and pressures and even temperature to a degree. Um, and then you have joint torque sensors uh, on the right. And a joint torque sensor is uh, in, uh, one means for having safe interaction with a robot is to have the joint itself uh, indicate that there's been uh, over torque. Um, once you have this sort of flexibility, um, dexterity in manipulation, you can now use force control to do some really uh, amazing things. So this is a rubber hose being put onto a mandrel for curing you can easily imagine that this is not a one-handed job. It does take this bilateral manipulation to make this work. But more importantly, there's a force sensor here in the mix that's uh, modulating the robot uh, position and speed as it performs that function. So it is force control in com combination with a dexterous manipulation, uh, meaning two hands, that lets you all of a sudden now design in automation for non-rigid materials. Um, another front in robot developments is the grasping. Right? We have dedicated grippers now. Um, they're parallel jaws or rotary uh, grippers, etc. They're very mature. Uh, they're limited to families of parts. You can have a parallel jaw deal with a set of uh, widths um, and maybe a, a rotary one here like is shown where it's got a, a, a range of ID or OD that it can handle. But that's not what we do, right? And what we're trying to move towards is a flexible, more anthropomorphic type of end effector. Uh, this is a shadow hand shown here. This is emerging technology now, and it is not cost effective uh, for industrial purposes. So somewhere in here, there needs to be uh, a middle ground because robots are valuable only insofar as the end effector works. Right, uh, Del Tesar is well known in the robotics community, and, and this is what he says, solve the gripper problem and you've solved the robot problem. And I paraphrase that to President Clinton. So what you're looking at here is an underactuated grasper. Uh, this is a three finger gripper, um, but you can see from the way that it's constructed that it can tolerate lots of different geometries of components. So Grasping is a uh, growing area of innovation. It's not just these underactuated graspers. There's new um, grippers that you know use the jamming transition to be able to pick up lots of different components. Uh, Empire Robotics is in that space, uh, even using electroadhesion or static uh, to be able to pick components. But here's an example of an underactuated grasper with uh, uh, this dexterity being used for kitting. Kitting is an application where you are trying to increase the productivity of a line worker. And if half the time the line worker is going and getting components for the assembly, well then there's really not very much value in that task. So if we can automate the kitting of the components for the um, uh, assembler, then we have gained efficiency and throughput. And what we're demonstrating is just a lot of different uh, components being picked with the same end effectors. All these different geometries being used 
by flexible grasping. Okay, ease of use, uh, we've come to understand, is really determined by the end user. Right? They're the ones that tell you what's easy for them. So uh, you have to move towards an open software approach. So um, all robot manufacturers, we have proprietary robot languages that have served us well in process robots and in uh, you know, automotive, etc. cetera. Um, ours is in form, uh, ABB has theirs, Fanuc has theirs. Um, on the right is uh, a different industry. So if you get at, uh, the assembly and move towards the quality control side, uh, all of those engineers are now very uh, used to dealing in LabVIEW. So rather than turning them into robot programmers, use the tools within robot programming to give them a LabVIEW experience. And that's what we mean by open uh, controls. Um, there are others. Uh, Ross Industrial is a emerging um, standard within, uh, grew out of the research robotics field, but is finding its way into more and more industrial purposes. Um, so there is a community that exploits the functionality of the Ross uh, software and applies it to uh, robot design. And then finally, of course, there's uh, PLC programmers. Right? There are lots of people in the automation community that are very strong PLC programmers but don't have robot background. How do you open robotic automation to them? You make it easy for them by letting them program within uh, the PLC environment. So I'll show this quickly. Um, this is an example of this new uh, something you would not have been able to do in a proprietary robot control. So in this case, this is a deburring path, a very complex one. It's con, uh, it's not just 2D, there's a angle in that component. All, all of this trajectory was generated automatically using tools within the Ross uh, software. Um, if you would have had to pick up a teach pendant to do all of this, you would not have said that was easy. Even if you would have had to lead the robot through or just use some sort of you know, other device, this is an example of where an automatically generated path is significant. So there are lots of drivers moving the robot industry forward. Some of them um, are directly from uh, technologies that are emerging. Some of them are just societal as our uh, uh, population ages and as we have to uh, deal with more and more um, uh, challenges in the workplace, uh, the technologies required to meet these challenges are innovating very quickly. Uh, that again is not because of anything we've done, it's just what's happening in the computing world and in consumer goods. Uh, and perception, mobility, grasping, ease of use, these are all elements required to help ease the burden of labor, which is really what robotics is all about. And that's what I have for you today. Thank you, Eric, great presentation. And now let's hear from Ryan. Ryan, to take over. Sure, just um, take over here. All right, thank you very much. So I think the, the first thing I've been asked to, um, asked to present on here is just provide a bit of a context for where we stand within robotics simply because we have a fairly, uh, I guess, non-traditional niche um, compared to the, the well-established field of industrial manipulation and industrial automation. And we, we started in one of the areas where we, we began as a, as a small company was recognizing that there is a great, great number of companies out there recognizing that there's a need for mobile autonomous systems and like the development of, of ARMS a few decades back is that there's a need for flexible mobile platforms on which you could mount sensors, ARMS as well, or, or other payloads. So as, as we developed there, we, within the last four years or so, this, this was quite validated by finding that there's a, we have about 300 clients right now and our, our products range from five kilograms to a thousand kilograms. We work with um, with multiple partners as well for arm manipulate or for as arm suppliers, as sensor suppliers, 
as our focus tends to be on autonomous bases and autonomous software around those bases. And then we move from, as, as we establish ourselves in research, we recognize that there is this need, an expanding need to offer similar solutions as a effectively a systems integrator and starting to discover these challenges of becoming a systems integrator with autonomous vehicles in a space which has been traditionally dominated by, by manipulation and indoor tasks, indoor automation. So um, we've, we've offered a few, we've begun offering services in custom robotics design and autonomous systems specifically for, for vehicles themselves. And what we've noticed is that there's, a, most companies are very interested, but no one's really willing to place a big bet yet. So we've had to structure our business such that we're able to to build one-off prototypes and uh, and do medium-scale production kind of in that range of unmanned systems and that brings with it quite a few interesting interesting challenges and uh, a first a first example of this was some work we we did early on in the history of our company which was to which was to apply autonomous intelligence systems to unmanned survey under unmanned water survey where it has a lot of similar similarities between the constraints you'd find in an industrial industrial factory it just happens to be on the water we need to make our systems easy to use there are significant safety concerns because of, of people operating in and, and around the water daily there are demands for accuracy and repeatability and traceability of the, the data that we're generating and collecting and the example here you can see is on the left is our Kingfisher unmanned surface vessel equipped with a, a survey grade sonar and on the right is data output provided in a format which is well used by it's it's a um, usable by GIS systems it's understood by civil engineers environmental engineers and people who are doing planning for infrastructure monitoring infrastructure so you can see there it's that it's a uh, stormwater pond we actually surveyed and what we found is that the systems we're able to do the, that we're able to deploy now are within two percent of previous methods and we don't need humans on the water anymore we don't need boat access required and that's it's really an example of how some the traditional traditional constraints are being placed on us but we still we have to use new technology um, with completely different technological constraints to solve these problems but we're seeing a, a great deal of acceptance and actually eagerness to adopt this technology which is a really great sign from our perspective of, of where these this technology is going to go in the next few years as we're seeing that people are more and more willing to accept this you know five years ago the idea of, of taking a self-driving boat and using that instead of these traditional survey methods which have been used for decades it just wouldn't be accepted by people and it's um, it's because of a lot of the work that's been done in industrial automation to make these these tasks easy to use as well as society starting to make robotics more acceptable that we're seeing the acceptance of this technology and then the design challenges I think are are fairly fairly similar to a number to to challenges which everyone tends to run into um, multi multidisciplinary engineering being key here that our system that when we're developing our technology of course there's the electrical electromechanical design but we're already getting we go all the way up to development of autonomous software which even beyond what we would call automatic software autonomous software development is a brand new field and Eric um, alluded to some of the power of that when he spoke of the, um, the deburring demo which I've actually had a chance to see in person it's really quite impressive and but those sorts that sort of software development is, is very new it's very difficult to find people who are capable of, of doing this and um, and of of thinking at that high of a system level because you're also having to take into a number of, of safety and other concerns when we get into especially when we're getting into system design and test and validation is we have the the industrial requirements and the safety requirements to, with that field but we have a blend there of also requiring these systems to work outdoors um, in difficult terrain difficult you know it, the Kingfisher has to work in and around the water in a variety of temperatures so we, we have this um, a combination we basically are becoming a, a vehicle design um, a vehicle design shop at times which is which brings on the um, 
a few challenges when we're also trying to work in autonomous software development at the same time. We basically decided to pick all the hard parts of, of engineering and decide to, uh, to start a company around them, which, um, which has a, it, it definitely can cause some hassles at times. On the, the other side, because of, of where we were positioned within the space and because of where unmanned systems or unmanned vehicles are, that we, we have a need to iterate very, very quickly. Um, time to market is key for a number of these companies. They're all wanting to be the companies which are out there with the first automated vehicle that, that does X. And unfortunately, that's impeded by, by lead times and physical realities. And what we try to do is obviously try to push as much of this work off the software as possible. Um, Moore's Law has definitely, has definitely enabled this. And um, that goes very, very much into reliability versus features. We, we need to be aware that the state of autonomous software is maturing rapidly. The, the technology that was brought up in the previous two presentations wasn't nearly as mature five years ago as it is today, and 10 years ago it simply didn't exist. So there's a trade-off here. There's no best practices when it comes to autonomous software design. We've had to establish a number of them on our own. And then one of the best practices here, the, I think the number one thing that we focus on, and this is something which we're seeing, we're seeing more and more, I would say, um, more established companies starting to jump on board with this, is the extensive use of open source software that in five, ten years ago within our field, you could sell, you could sell basically a simple development tool, simple SLAM um, or simultaneous localization and mapping libraries for $10,000 a seat. That was, that was possible, and that didn't even solve any business problems. That didn't bring any value to the client. But what we found is that there's a number of these technologies, like Ross Industrial, for example, has to do with manipulator arms. But the core middleware behind that, Ross itself, is something that we rely on heavily for field robotics. And what it means is that, that the technology development that goes on to support our debugging tools also works for the tools at Yaskawa, even though they're, we're, we're targeting completely different markets. Likewise, it means that work between companies and partnerships between companies goes very quickly. Technology transfer can happen very fast. And from a training perspective, getting developers trained um, means that it's very easy to find people who, work, who know how to debug our software because they've used that software in other, uh, in other fields, just perhaps not with the, uh, the unique flavor we have around it. Um, risk analysis and test plans are fairly are fairly, um, I would say, obvious, but it is still something which, which we've called out here because it's what we've, what we've experienced is that there's a number of companies who are very, very experienced with traditional automation, but they, they may not be as familiar with the various risks that come out with, with dealing with vehicles and, and how you test vehicles. For instance, a, um, using a CMM to qualify the, the accuracy of localization doesn't exactly work that much when the, the vehicle itself needs to traverse an entirely factory floor, for example, or when we're trying to, to say that it's, it's accurate after, you know, a 20 kilometer an hour run and we want to be accurate within a few centimeters at the end of that using a traditional CMM won't work. Um, motion capture systems are feasible but expensive and then you're getting into also you have your own localization capabilities on board but we're not um, it's a question of how you properly test that so you can use it to characterize your systems. Um, and that also leads into user focus design. More and more people we're seeing are, are starting to accept that this is a necessity with, with robotics, um, that we need to make these systems easier and easy to use to, to deploy them, in, in our case, to deploy them in, in fields which haven't seen robotics before or in the, the previous two presenters' um, cases, to deploy them in in areas where robotics isn't being as accepted or where they're not able to afford having a few people full time just maintaining their systems. When we're getting into small shops where you just want to bring a robot or you just want to bring a robot in as a, as a coworker, as a similar to how you, you might bring in a, a mill or, or a drill. You don't need to have somebody there who's paid to program it. They can just use it. And that, I think that's important on both the industrial side and also in some of these newer markets that we're exploring. 
And then likewise, even, even from our side, we, with the, the prevalence of, of 3G and LTE, building the robots to test, to self-test and diagnose themselves on a continuous basis is really somewhere to, is really something to take advantage of. Um, there's a lot of work which has been done in developing software software engineering practices, and it's something that we try to, to ask ourselves is where can continuous integration tech practices, um, where can, can agile development be applied to robotics and hardware specifically? Uh, I mean, we, if we have to build these complex systems with, with a great deal of sensors and computation on board, we may as well take advantage of some of the features that come with this, and that is the ability to self-diagnose them. That is the ability to self-test your system, to communicate back to, back to the office, to enable remote diagnosis. And then the other thing, which is, I think is very, very key for us, much less so on the, on the industrial side, is to get simple robots accepted first. That in, in our field, these, the most complicated tools some of, some of our users will use is a, um, is a GPS system, for example. So we, should, we try to build complexity, but we don't try to deploy complexity into the market. We need people to accept that our tools work. Um, once the other, the other idea here is that because these are areas where nobody really fully understands, we need to understand our, our users better. So we need to, because in some, area, some cases where the first people to even try deploying an, an automated system into these, um, these settings, the users themselves don't always know what they want, or they don't always know the capabilities of the vehicle. And a great example of this is our, our unmanned survey craft, where it seems obvious that, that they want an unmanned or completely autonomous GPS-guided vehicle at the beginning. That seems like an obvious case, but that's not actually what we found to be the easiest way to bring it in, is that people want to have a remote control vehicle that they can work with right at the beginning, that that's what, they, that's what they're comfortable with. And then we can always deploy autonomy later once they're comfortable with the idea of a robot accept or the robot collecting their data for them. And then I think it was also something from from my perspective being being asked, you know, where is autonomy going? What are these autonomous systems here? And from the industrial perspective, we've seen um, a number of people are no doubt familiar with the Rethink Robotics Baxter, which is meant to address these immediately, and they're already shipping these, these systems, address these low volume or, or very flexible or requirement for very flexible co-robots. And I think in the, the next two years, we're seeing these robots, we're going to see more and more of these robots working side by side with humans. And we're seeing already the, the trend towards developers of developing tools as opposed to general solutions that we're not trying to um, we're not trying to build robots when when it comes to vehicles, aero vehicles, surface vessels. We're not trying to build robots that can do everything. We're trying to look at robots which are just smarter tools. Uh, one way to look at our tool is it's just smarter sonar. It happens to float and know where it is at all times and get where it wants to go. Um, but that's where it is. You see, on the left is our system, and on the right, those two uh, gentlemen in the boat. That's what's being replaced. Um, you can see their method is, is much less safe than ours. And then the other example here, the Arion Labs camera. This is a UAV used for, used for security, used for surveillance, used for surveying. And we look at that as it's a flying camera. It's not a robot. It's, it's just a really smart camera that happens to fly. And what we're seeing here is that generally the market is accepting the technology. Um, there's upfront hardware investment still, but the, market's, the market is still accepting the technology here. Um, but I think in the, next, in the next five years coming up, and in some of these, these are all examples, but we'll see them go further and further out, is that all, I think more systems will just by default be ready for autonomy so that when we're at looking to add new features, we are only talking about software development. We're only talking about understanding users we don't actually have to make any hardware changes anymore. That makes it very easy to really focus on the cost and benefit of the autonomous software itself as opposed to the cost and benefit, for example, of deploying a new robot. If we have a new robot or if we have a robot that's completely ready for working side by side with humans, we don't need to convince anybody to bring in, to buy, to spend that capital investment anymore. We only need to ask them what, they're, what, they're, what they would pay for a new software capability. And that, I think, makes 
life much easier for those people who are trying, who are very sensitive to buying new tools and the costs associated with them. And the examples here, the John Deere 6R series is almost completely, I think, completely autonomy ready. Everything's drive by wire on board. And there's a number of other vehicles like that. I mean, cars are going that way as well. Um, we're looking, looking at the examples of phones. We've had cell phones, which you can consider modern cell phones to be robots now, and they've deployed a few in space, just as an example of this. And then on the right side is a thermostat, just a, a smart adaptive thermostat, which is now if you're, you're seeing the news coming out of this company, they are expanding it further and further until basically your house is now being enabled so that you can develop software for your house. That's, that's some of the directions that some of these companies are going in. And then in the, in the long-term perspective here, which comes back to where the, the autonomy and where these autonomous systems are from a um, industrial perspective, we're, we're seeing that we believe that safety systems will be decreasing in cost by orders of magnitude. I don't believe in 10 years that we'll be spending, you know, $6,000, $8,000 for a laser scanner anymore. I think that we're going to be seeing much smarter systems that can, that are intrinsically safe, different ways of making systems intrinsically safe camera-based systems, um, areas where we can, where in the past safety was the largest cost involved, I think that cost is going to be significantly dropping. And likewise, there's, there's been a number, there's, there's obviously a great deal of media attention being paid to um, unmanned cars. And I think in the 10-year time frame, we are looking at there will be regulatory and legal frameworks to be in place to allow users who are not necessarily educated in these areas to use complex and potentially dangerous systems safely. So ideas like cars or like large manipulator systems where in the past you've had that specialized training to do this or otherwise control your environment, that in the 10-year time frame we're going to be seeing these regulatory and legal systems in place because that is one of the big blockers behind some of this adoption into, um, into use by a larger segment of the population. And at this point, I would say that at this point, we accept that autonomy, that there are areas where humans can be completely res removed from responsibility for completing these tasks, like, um, like autonomous driving, or as, uh, as was alluded to earlier, like complex programming or inflexible manufacturing, that we're going to be able to just work side by side safely and easily. And uh, I think that's, that's kind of where we're going here. I mean, even on the right-hand side, that's, this is a great example of I, I don't, I'm not going to comment on the business case whatsoever, but that's a, a startup company that wants to do textbook delivery via drone, like short-term or small package delivery via UAV. And that's something that they're just going to go ahead and do it right now, but that's something where the regulatory and legal framework definitely needs to be in place to, to imagine tens of thousands of those flying through any city at any, any given time. That, that's something which, which needs to be a little bit more addressed, not on the technical side, but on the... Uh, on the legal side. I think that's, um, that's all of my presentation right now. All right, thank you, Ryan. All right, we're going to use the remaining time, everyone, for questions. Uh, we have some that have been coming in, but it is not too late. You can send in your question. Simply use the little dialog box on your GoToWebinar screen, type it in, and uh, we will ask as many as we can. All right, gentlemen, the first question. Uh, in your opinion, what is the limiting factor in human-robot collaboration feasibility? Uh, Nate, do you want to handle that, or do you want me uh, to uh, sure. respond? Uh, yeah, the, the limiting factor uh, is, um, what is the robot, uh, is robot and human contact, is, is that, if that occurs, is, is it going to uh, uh, be injurious to the uh, to the human. And so one thing affecting that obviously is momentum, which is the product of velocity and, and mass. If you can get enough momentum up, you're, uh, you're going to injure a human if you run into them at any, uh, at any velocity that's uh, too high for, for them um, to withstand. Um, and so uh, right now uh, you have that uh, factor that's keeping the robot payloads uh, in these uh, dual arm and multi arm designs, uh, somewhat lower. Um, so, uh, unless you employ some other sensing device external, perhaps to the robot or maybe even on the robot, that enables uh, them to predict 
that their uh, contact is going to happen, um, uh, then that's an acceptable method as well. So payload, the payload is very important in robotics, and uh, higher payloads and velocities equal momentum, and that equals injury. So to me, that's, those are the limiting factors. I'd like to add to that. Mm -hmm. um, so let's take this from a different approach. I agree with what Nick is saying, that if you have mass and you have velocity, uh, you're going to have pain, right? Um, but I think the limiting factor is really from the user's perspective, and that is what is your, you know, how risk averse are you as an organization, okay? Um, right now, the robot safety standards are sort of in flux with this whole idea of collaboration. And as such, um, you know, if your organization is, uh, you know, risk averse, you're, you're going to want to be able to rely and point to a standard that says, hey, I have complied with this standard, I have mitigated the risks like was pointed out previously, I've identified them, I've done what I can to mitigate them, therefore, you know, should there be an unfortunate incident, um, I have good, solid, foundation that I have done everything in my power to keep that from being so. Um, when you sort of decide, hey, I'm going to be looking at uh, sort of stepping outside of that, then, you know, uh, if the standards haven't caught up to the technology you're trying to employ, then, you know, you need to consider if that's really where you want to be. Right. That's what I mean about being how risk averse are you as an organization is what standards are you going to rely on, um, you know, should the man come knocking at the door. Right. Okay. Another question from one of our viewers. What are your thoughts on HMI using voice communication for, for example, programming or teaching? Yeah, so that's an ease of use issue. Um, yes, there uh, have already been demonstrated implementations of voice command um, sort of interactive dialogue with, with a robot controller, right? Robot, begin, you know, servos on, and then, you know, uh, move positive X. Uh, so the modality is fine, but, you know, in, in my experience, a lot of times we get infatuated with a with a certain technique even if when you look from 30,000 feet it really didn't make it easier right mm -hmm. so what we we don't want to trade one set of hassle for a different set of hassle um, you know so when we look at using voice commands or anything else it's how does that fit into a thin light easy interaction with this device if you can do that, then I'm all for uh, voice control. Um, if I could actually add something to that, just on a related note, that I, I saw a, 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 a talk last week where he quoted that by the age of 20, the average, uh, average North, North American male will have played 12,000 hours of video games. And the concept that he was bringing up there is that there's already training being done on these complex interfaces as embodied by video games. So that might be something for people to look at when they're developing interfaces is that there are people who are there by the, by the time you're that, by the time you're 20 years old, if there's, you already have all of this experience with, with game pads and other sorts of um, on screen interfaces that that might be something to take into account when, uh, when you're doing ease of use work. Mm -hmm. Or it's just second nature for them. That's All right, right, next question. Uh, robot safety standards are changing. What is the impact of these developments on system design? Well, I think as I alluded to, uh, as the safety standards change, uh, the effect on uh, um, cell design uh, is, is, uh, is very positive. Uh, impact because some some uh, of the safety standards would just uh, handcuff uh, an engineer. Uh, there there gets to be a point where something is is just uh, too safe to use. I recall seeing uh, uh, people in uh, automotive plants um, before they go in the 
uh, to work or clean out, out of cell, they would uh, have the maintenance crew go in and, and literally wrap chains around the robot, uh, <laughs> which is it is funny, but uh, there, there is a, a big fear of uh, robotics. Um, so I think uh, I think the the effect is a uh, very much a positive effect. And I would add to that that one of the first significant wins with the change in the safety standard is the footprint of the work cell. You know, even if you are never going to have human robot interaction, just the fact that the new safety standard allows the safeguarding to recognize the operating envelope of the robot, not its maximum envelope, is a huge gain in um, you know the the footprint that's going to be required for your work cell in a in a safe way. So um, the only reason that the safety standard allows for this now is because robot control software has become sophisticated enough and has become robust in how it is architected, what we call the SIL ratings of the robot software, such that when it says it's over here at XYZ, it is in fact at XYZ in a safe way. So that means you no longer need a lot of these you know, electromechanical switches to, to say in fact in a redundant fashion the robot is at XYZ or over in zone A. Um, it can do that now in inherent in the in the robot controller, what ABB referred to as EPS and what FANUC calls DCS and Yaskawa calls uh, FSU. It's all the same idea of using the robot controller software to say you are in a position and you know you're in that position to a safe to a high degree of certainty. And that impact is you can now trust the robot controller so you can make the cell smaller. That's a uh, a huge uh, benefit to the end user. Okay. One last question here. We'll try and sneak in uh, within the hour. How long do uh, each of you think it will be before mobile robots are prevalent? Um, I, w I would depend. Well, I, I, would dep I, I think. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, I guess it really depends on on what. Prevalent, prevalent means. I mean, uh, Amazon.com bought Kiva Systems last year, and those those warehouses, I believe, probably have more mobile robots than humans in them at this point. Any warehouse based on on the Kiva system. Um, I know that pretty much every every robotics manufacturer I've spoken to does incorporate mobile robotics of a certain kind. I think what what needs to be, if we're talking about the industrial context, we really need to get um, get flexible manipulation, as, as Eric has alluded to, in a little bit greater sense for mobile robots to really come into their own safety and flexible manipulation. Because for a mobile robot to be truly um, applicable, you need to not have to worry about safety guarding. Um, and you also have to be able to deal with some of the greater, uh, greater tolerance for error, because a mobile robot simply can't have the same precision as a, uh, as a fixed mounted manipulator arm. If you're talking, if you're talking about mobile robots outside of outside of indus or uh, industrial manufacturing, that's a completely different question, I guess. Yeah, and I would segment it by saying mobile robots are fairly prevalent. As Ryan was uh, saying, if you go into distribution centers and warehouses and such, there is a lot more um, mobile robots, but those are mobile bases. I think what what a lot of industry is clamoring for is mobile manipulation, and you know the the combination of a autonomous or at least programmable motion platform with a robot arm on it to do a meaningful work when it gets there uh, and that is where the technology push is now um, you know but I'm bullish on mobile manipulation I think you know whether it's uh, five years or, or ten years before it is a commodity sort of uh, offering the way industrial robots are today, um, uh, I can't say for certain, but clearly the market demand for robots that act and have more of the form factor of uh, the burden of labor, uh, that's evident. All right, great. Well, that is all the questions that we have time for. 
If you do have additional questions that come to mind, you are welcome to email those to me at pheaney at wtwhmedia.com, and I will make sure to forward them to our speakers. Thank you, everyone, for attending this webinar from Design World and our kind sponsors, Harmonic Drive, National Instruments, Maxon Motors, and IGIS. This presentation will be emailed to everyone in the coming days, and it will also be available at our website, www.designworldonline.com. And thanks once again to Nick, Eric, and Ryan for all of their insights. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. Goodbye. Bye.